the glass pipe is a, a particularly an American type of object. You know, America's a pretty young country and we don't have those ceremonial objects. It was all just kind of in the fabric of music and traveling and it's just like getting out in America and experiencing it and marijuana culture. I feel like that's like the, one of the first uh, things that is gonna be uniquely American. I came up just immersed in hip hop. Eric B and Rakim, Public Enemy, the Beastie Boys, and uh, that's when we started doing graffiti and, and just, you know, no graffiti as far as spray paint, but you spend, I spend every day doing my name and doodles and that kind of stuff. I've never met uh, Colton, but I do really like his work. For me, he was probably one of the first uh, pipe makers work that I saw years ago when I started up blowing glass. I, I feel like his work has a certain sophistication that maybe other pipes don't have. His work looks difficult to do, which is what I really like about it. And then that like it has this action, you know, like a movement to it, even though it's a, you know, it's not moving, you know. So it kind of um, makes me think of graffiti on trains that's whizzing by. You know, or maybe like some sort of roller coaster, or like cityscape with just all of these things going on. I believe the museum piece is kind of just uh, kind of all that kind of wrapped in one. My growing up with hip hop and then just kind of traveling with music. I'm still just practicing, trying to get get shapes and and have enough time to push the limits of, of, of you know, attachments and assembly and uh, so it's all a mixed bag of, of, of that that I grew up with. Seeing the piece in the space, it f immediately I felt that the there could not have been a better decision made. Dave Colton has been around for a long time. He's, he, I, I believe he started in like 95, and he has like, you know, so he's like paid his dues. You know, he's not like Johnny come lately. He's like, he's been a part of it, you know, six years longer than I have personally, you know? And so that is, uh, that feels right. The Dave's work is, is graffiti made, you know, three dimensional. Uh, well, I uh, started in 95, really just because our roommates that we moved into a house with were, uh, you know, I think five years older than us. And uh, at the time they were selling a lot of glass um, at the Grateful Dead lot kind of thing. And, um, and uh, we always thought it was just, we were infatuated with glass and the glass pipe mainly. Glass uh, cannabis pipe making is, is a super interesting thing. It is like such a, it's such a particular um, modern world phenomena. The pioneering efforts of, of one guy, uh, a fellow named Bob Snodgrass, who used to travel along with the Grateful Dead in the 80s and, and 90s, and who in the early 90s developed a, a thing called the color change pipe. And so that was um, just a simple pipe. He made uh, pipes with skulls on them, it was the Grateful Dead, where he would fume um, silver or gold on the inside. And what that means is he would heat up um, a little piece of silver or gold and that would deposit on the inside of the glass tube that made the pipe. As one used it, um, it would fill in with resin behind those, uh, behind that uh, veiling, and all of a sudden it would be um, have intense colors, intense pink, intense orange, intense blue, as if it was revealing itself. And when the Grateful Dead stopped touring in 1995, Bob Snodgrass settled down. He started teaching people to make to make pipes, and Dave Colton started working in pipes around that same sort of moment. We just decided to 
go down to Golden, Colorado and to uh, buy the starter kit from uh, Glasscraft. And uh, one of the fellas that uh, was friends with them was buying glass right from Bob Snodgrass. And uh, he hung out there long enough to know that, how to make a bowl hole and push a bowl. And so he was in town for maybe two days when we got the starter kit and he kind of sh showed us and told us how to blow a hole on the, the carb and the, the bowl hole. And, uh, and so me and three other roommates kind of jumped in and started making pipes. <laughs> The rock band, The Grateful Dead, have sort of carried the, the hippie spirit from the 60s right up through contemporary times. And uh, as they traveled and toured the country, uh, there were many of their fans who would continue to travel along with them. And it sort of created this traveling community of folks who would tour the country, and those folks would bring many of their interests along with them. In the late 80s and early 90s, we started to see some of these glass pipes showing up in that scene as well. And it was a very receptive audience. It was an audience that was prepared to use these objects, it had a great appeal to their interest in handcraft, and uh, it exposed a lot of folks to this new possibility in glass. And it, it was a great environment for that glass to then get spread across the country because these people are traveling the country as well. So it was a, a good breeding ground for the craft to grow, to share it with the rest of the country, and to, to really spread out this new form of craft. It was, we were living a crazy lifestyle. It was just like, you know, just work and then go to the shows all summer and you just stockpile and whatnot. And it was just craziness wrapped with glass and music and the whole thing. And um, um, probably around 2000, especially after 2001, 9-11 and stuff, um, it wasn't quite as fun. And what, uh, you know, I started to really take it seriously. Pipes were mostly sold in this kind of informal economy that grew up around these concerts, but they were sort of traded out outside of the view of um, most people. That changed in the early aughts um, when pipe makers, some of the more established companies, less individuals working on their own, um, started using the internet to sell their wares. And um, soon after September 11th, um, with the, with the founding of um, Homeland Security. Uh, it, after they had spent some effort on that, by 2003 they were looking for other challenges and they decided to go after um, some of these pipe makers that were using the internet and they, got, they arrested them on interstate commerce laws that you couldn't sell um, marijuana pipes or cannabis pipes across state lines. So they um, busted all of these pipe makers. Many of them lost their businesses. Um, they were on house arrest. And after that, um, it really changed the landscape for pipe making in the United States. Um, many pipe makers laid low. If they were underground before, they were now like bo deeply below ground. They were burrowing. Um, and uh, and the, when they did reemerge, in the vacuum created, because there was still the need for these, um, there were cheap knockoffs made in India and China. You can see those all over the place if you stop at a gas station and there's uh, cannabis pipes, or if you're in New York City and you see them at a bodega, those are imported, made in China or India to look like American pipes of the early aughts. Um, and when American pipe makers came back into the field, they really had to push the high end and they really pushed innovation in form and in technique. Um, and that's what you see in the work of Dave Colton. I had been out west for 
almost 20 years, and um, and I was ready just to, to work, and I have a big family back here, um, so um, I hadn't been hanging out with them quite as much, and um, so I was prepared just to, just to come back, hunker down, you know, help out my folks a little bit, um, vice versa, and um, make a go of it and uh, decided to take some classes at Corning. And uh, I, I, I took uh, Santini's class, I took uh, Cesare's class shortly after that. And between those two classes, two week classes, um, I learned enough to lock myself in a shop for 10 years. 2019 rolls around and here we are with, with uh, his piece that he's made for for Corning and and he uh, shows it to me and I, I'm just amazed at what he had done, uh, how it was a functional pipe, and uh, it really talking to Susie, it kind of it, it just reinforced everything that I I thought that it, it's real art. It really is. It, you shouldn't put a label on it and and deem it as as something we shouldn't be involved in. It. it we're too quick to put a label on and, and say, oh, it's bad, it's bad, it's not. And uh, so I, I'm so proud that he's, he's kind of breaking this barrier, that the pipe makers are gonna be really looked at differently after this year and after David's award. I mean, it's so uh, overwhelming just from experiencing Corning 20 years ago, taking classes there. And just knowing just how over the top and how the tradition of glass and, and corning and the museum and uh, just uh, um, yeah, I'm I'm blown away by by receiving the award. It's hard to really come to grips with uh, with something like that, um, especially when uh, uh, I'm not feeling like I'm the most accomplished glass blower or any aspect of being worthy of the Ring Award. So, but at the same time, I do feel like I've worked day and night to try to get to this point, even though I didn't know this was even a point uh, to, to, to shoot for. Our museum and the Rake Out Commission specifically has the ability to really um, to really open people's eyes up to seeing glass in a new way, to seeing artwork in a new way. And my hope is that through this Rake Out Commission, um, other, other people, other museums, other curators, other enthusiasts, other collectors can really begin to see this field of practice um, for the, the dedicated, interesting, um, important work that it is.